All right, I think it's time to get this show on the road. Uh, a slightly belated, very happy new year to you all. Thank you very much for taking some time out of your day today. Uh, we have for you the latest Meraki Quarterly, and I am surrounded by an incredible group of product managers and product marketing managers who are going to take us through the latest and greatest from Meraki. Let's get things straight on the road, because we've got a lot to cover today. So just a quick reminder, especially if you are new to the Meraki Quarterly, we have a few little uh, notes to make here. Firstly, this is targeted at established Meraki customers and partners. So if you are brand new to Meraki, we may lose you at some point. Please join one of our introductory webinars, get yourself on a trial, and get familiar with what we're doing, and we'd be very happy to have you back at a future quarterly. Now, this show is presented, as I said, by uh, Product Marketing, and we have guests here as well. We've got a couple of product managers joining us. And this is really a retrospective look back over the last quarter. So this is really not a roadmap session. This is a roadmap-free zone, and we reserve the rights to completely ignore any roadmap questions that come in on the Q&A. So please do keep that in mind. We will share as much as we can with you. But the aim here is to just give you an opportunity to catch up with all the many things that we've been doing. And it's so many things right now. Uh, we're, we're struggling ourselves to keep up with it. So we're really happy to be sharing this with you. And without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Emily, who is going to take us through a brief session on Meraki Wireless. Ooh. Hello, hello. Great to be with you guys today. So we had a couple of really awesome announcements this past quarter on the wireless front. And I want to start with one of the biggest ones. That was the introduction of our new MR30H1102. Oh, sorry, 802.11 AC Wave 2 uh, access point. So this is a fantastic little device. Uh, we're really thrilled about it because what it is doing is truly targeting uh, use cases around multi-dwelling wireless, in particular if you're in the hospitality uh, or perhaps the higher ed uh, industries or uh, you know maybe you are dealing with um, things like assisted living or any situation where you're going to want to be putting a single access point into uh, individual rooms where you have uh, plenty of people back-to-back, uh, -back, room to room, this is a fantastic device for you. It's small, it's sleek, it's competitively priced. Uh, again, it is running the latest 11AC Wave 2 architecture. It does support multi-user MIMO 2 by 2 so you can service client devices simultaneously. And the biggest and most awesome feature of it, perhaps, is the integrated four-port gigabit Ethernet switch. So in particular, for example, if you're in a hotel, um, you might want to be hooking up IPTVs or uh, perhaps other IP-enabled devices. And it does come with all of the other fantastic features that you come to expect with Meraki wireless access points, like integrated location analytics and that dedicated uh, Bluetooth radio, as well as that dedicated radio for wireless intrusion prevention and detection uh, and auto RF. So that was the first announcement that we made. Uh, and, oh, interesting, there's a case study slide here. Uh, so we will just very quickly review that. Um, basically, this is deployed uh, at the Cliffs Resort. This is a fantastic uh, property of the boutique hotel collection. And I just wanted to highlight it uh, because Prior to deploying Meraki, this, uh, you know, this is a 13 property, uh, uh, um, uh, what do I want to say, like hotel management group. Um, so they're overseeing about 600 rooms. And, you know, prior to that uh, and prior to the current IT manager joining, they were really in an unmanaged, uncentralized situation. They were running consumer-grade wireless. Uh, they were having issues with outages in the Wi-Fi, and they were actually – uh, getting to a point where clients were getting negative reviews because they had had such um, spotty wireless. And so they were looking for a solution that would allow them to get centralized visibility and control. Uh, they wanted to find something where the, the wireless was stable, uh, and they had to put wireless in every single room uh, because of things like thick walls uh, in their properties. <clears throat> so uh, the rollout was very quick, very easy. I just wanted to highlight the quote at the top of your screen. Um, the IT manager said that the Meraki plug-and-play installation shaved at least a month off of their deployment cycle, which is incredible when you think about it. So they do have those MR30Hs deployed in room at this property, uh, and they do have Meraki access points deployed elsewhere. 
across their properties as well. And so just to sort of very quickly give you a look at what uh, the MR30H looks like in dashboard, it is slightly different from the regular access point um, uh, sort of setup here in the sense that you're going to see those ports up at the top of your dashboard screen when you're looking at one of those MR30Hs. Uh, in the configuration setting, and it's great because what you can do is you can go in and you can configure SSIDs, for example, a guest SSID or, uh, you know, perhaps your in-house SSID, and then what you can do is you can use port profiles to basically pass through those SSIDs to the wired client. So wired clients connecting directly to those ports uh, can basically receive the uh, security and authentication settings of that SSID, and you have the ability to go through and select multiple access points at once and push out those profiles. So it's a very quick and easy way to go in and configure a, sort of a homogenous port setting uh, for various access points throughout your deployment. And then the second major announcement that we had was the MR33. So this is a very, very cute little access point that is very sleek and very compact. It is actually about, I think, 52% uh, roughly thereabouts of the volume of an MR32. In fact, it can fit inside the casing of an MR32. Uh, and it is basically the update, the 11AC Wave 2 update um, to uh, basically the MR32 in many ways. And it is a quad radio like normal, right? Uh, integrated Bluetooth radio, a 2.4 gigahertz radio, a 5 gigahertz radio, uh, and then that dedicated dual band for WIPs and, and uh, auto RF. And we like to say that it is burrito sized goodness. It is small, it is compact. If you're looking for something uh, sleek to uh, discreetly uh, place, uh, you know, amidst. Um, amidst your uh, environment, this is the access point for that. We would encourage you to use hot sauce as well. All right, thanks, Emily. We're now going to keep the show rolling. Next up is Meraki Communications with June. Your MC for MC. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, Emily. That was very interesting and awesome to learn about the MR. Uh, moving forward, we're going to talk about all the new developments with Meraki Communications this quarter. And this has been a really big quarter for us feature-wise. So for all of you guys out there that have Meraki deployed in your office, in your schools, in your house even, um, hopefully you've seen all of our new features that have both moved into production and have, you know, been available widely to everybody. But also, if you're part of our current private beta, um, I'm going to talk about those features as well. So. We have all of these new use cases based on the features that we've been releasing, but we've tried to maintain the same great user experience that you've come to expect from the Meraki MC. So what this means is not only have we improved and added all of these great features, we've also made sure that the user interface stays just as intuitive as you would expect, and you know we'll actually see a little bit of that later on. I do want to call um, to I want to call your attention to the fact that. At the very beginning of this quarter, we announced call groups and announcements into beta, and they've now been, you know, pushed out to everybody. So all of our customers that have Meraki MCs have gotten these great new features completely for free, and this is part of our software as a service updating, firmware updates, and kind of that value proposition that we like to talk about for our customers. Um, the majority of the features on this page, though, are currently in beta, so if you call into Meraki, you can call into Meraki support, you can ask for these to be enabled on your network. And for all of you guys that don't have Meraki MCs yet, you should definitely call into your sales support line and ask for a trial because we're releasing features very quickly and it's a really great product for you to try and see if it works in your deployment. So when you look at the uh, MC screen, there's a few changes that I want to call your attention to. So first off, if you tap the top right corner, you see that now we have multi-line support on the phone. So you can assign multiple phone numbers to your phone and have calls come in on either of those numbers as well as call out from those numbers. Additionally, you also have this great favorites tab on every phone. So what this means is if you want to, you know, favorite numbers to have them closer to you, more easy access, you can do that by tapping the gold star on the contact. In this, I'm removing the WebEx contact, but it's very easy to add it as well. 
So when you receive a call, and uh, we'll see that on the screen in just a little bit, when you receive a call to one of your numbers, you'll see that the call, you'll see the number that it comes in on, but you'll also see exactly which number that phone call is calling. So if you have a main business line and then a personal line, you can make sure that you answer them you know, respectively and correctly. I also want to make sure that, um, for those of you that don't know, the Meraki MC is this great touchscreen phone. It has this beautiful uh, touchscreen. Oh, we have a call. Okay, so you can see that it's coming into the uh, 415 line, and that's not the main line that's showing on the top right corner. But if you want to transfer this to somebody, so let's say, you know, I want to transfer this to my office phone, and I can see with the green presence dot that I'm currently available, so I can ask to transfer, and what this is called is a warm transfer in some other uh, phone systems. But I can call the contact, ask them if they would like to take a call, and if they say yes, I can complete the transfer, and if they say no, I can also cancel that transfer. And you see now that the presence dot is red, and that means that I'm currently on a call. So I also wanted to walk you guys through a few of the different changes to dashboard for MC. And we'll hop over to our dashboard right here. And I'm going to move to the Meraki Corp phone system. So this is our general phone system that's deployed in all of our um, conference rooms in our San Francisco office. And you'll see that, you know, over here, over the phones tab, we have this new feature called call groups. And when I click on it, we'll see that these are all of the call groups that are configured for my current uh, deployment. And what I can do is I can go to all reception phones and I can change the ring strategy. So this is the different ways that phones are enabled to ring. Round Robin will go through and ring each one. Uh, longest idle will ring the one that's been the longest idle first, and then the second longest idle simultaneous ring will ring all of them at the same time. I can also change which phones are ringing based on tags. So if I want all of my reception phones and all of my first floor phones to ring, I can do that with tags. I can also do a lot of different logical configurations based on any of the tags, all of the tags, the same that you would expect with all Meraki um, logical configurations. Lastly, I can upload hold music so that people who are calling into my call group can listen to wonderful hold music or informative things about my business. I can set a max wait time before the call goes to another group, and I can also add what that call should do after that max wait time. So. These are options like send to voicemail, send to another phone, send to an IVR, another call group, conference room, et cetera. And with this, you can do a lot of really great advanced configuration of your dial plan. So thank you guys very much. Uh, it was great talking to you. If you guys have any other questions, please come and watch a Intro to Meraki Communications webinar or talk to your sales rep today. Thanks. Well, this is the moment you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. It's Tony Carmichael and the switch. Wow, what an intro. Thank you, Simon. Thanks uh, to all of you out there in the audience. Uh, this is, of course, the most important of all of our updates today. Switches uh, keep things connected after all. Um, so the first thing that we're tremendously excited about is a uh, very healthy update to our switching portfolio. We actually went in and uh, added the MS-225 and 250. These are all about performance, uh, and these are all about getting physical stacking as well. So you're gonna get, you're gonna find the physical stacking interfaces on both of these models. And then the difference between the two is that they're gonna have either the RPS port for power uh, or on the MS-250, you're gonna have the hot swappable power supplies. Depending on what your needs are, these are both very powerful, very high performance platforms. And they're designed to be the new generation uh, when it comes to our entry level and mid tier product uh, lines. Now this also uh, in other ways is exciting because you're actually getting the exact same price points on these from their predecessors, the MS220 and 320. So with the 225, again, you get that stacking, you get 10 gigabit SFT plus interfaces uh, and, and the same on the MS250 at the exact same price points. These are also fully compatible 
with the MS220 and 320 line. So if we take a look at the uh, high-level uh, overview of the portfolio now, we have that compact uh, MS228 port, and then we move our way up to the 1U format, the MS225, 250, and 350. We've also added a comparison table to our website. I invite for, uh, all of you to take a look at that because it's going to really help you uh, in terms of positioning, right? It, it helps you, uh, uh, hopefully helps our customers really figure out what makes sense where. Uh, but as you can see, the MS350 is really our flagship line with the multi-gigabit capabilities um, and UPOE options as well, alongside the 160 gig stacking capabilities, whereas the 225 and 250 offer 80. Now, we've also been quite busy on the software front. We actually have uh, quite a large uh, software release that went out this past quarter, um, so we'd like to re recover those as well. Um, the first of, the first feature, um, and, and these are fairly, these are really designed for large-scale networks um, or for those networks where security is absolutely paramount. Um, so the first of these features is called multi-domain authentication. Um, this is really all about the scenario where you're deploying, say, a, an IP-connected phone, um, such as the MC, and you want to make sure to protect that downstream link. Most modern IP phones are going to have that two-port interface or two-port switch in there, and what you don't want is the scenario where someone takes that and uses it as an authenticator. Um, they plug it into the network, it's permitted on, and then you can plug anything downstream of it in um, without further authentication. Requirements. Um, then change of authorization uh, support was released this quarter as well. This is great for those environments where um, you as a customer is already invested in a NAC solution or a security posturing solution. So you want to make sure, in other words, that anyone plugging into the network gets profiled uh, accordingly. Um, say you have a higher education environment, you have faculty, you have students, you have contractors, you have visitors. You, you don't want to necessarily treat everyone equally. You want to make sure faculty gets access to the internal resources they need, and certainly not with students, right? So that's what that feature is all about. And what's exciting about this for us is it's a fantastic framework for us to now continue to expand on our capabilities. Um, with things like URL redirect, we can allow for you to point them to whatever uh, HTTP address you want to point them to, um, put main, keep them in a captive portal environment, uh, interact with them however you see fit, and then put them onto the part of the network. And then lastly, uh, protocol independent multicast. So this is all about uh, being able to route um, a multicast traffic from different subnets. Um, and this is really, again, uh, typical in a larger environment where your switching infrastructure is handling all of your uh, uh, routing. And so what I've, what I've done here is given a couple of quick visuals. As you can see for multi-domain auth on the left, we have it disabled. We have that VoIP, voice over IP phone, um, which is being prompted for something like, say, MAC authentication bypass. But then anything behind it is just going to be uh, allowed onto the network. Enter multi-domain auth, and you now maintain separate authentication at layer two. So you ensure the phone, as well as that endpoint workstation, or whatever IP-connected device shows up behind there gets prompted. Change of authorization, um, this also comes along with uh, enhanced ICE support. So any of you out there who have um, Cisco's Identity Services Engine, um, now you can uh, really deploy Meraki switches uh, through and through and use that change of authorization with URL redirect, wall gardening, all of those features are now there. And as I said before, really what we found is that in the education space, in the healthcare space, um, and, and, and a variety of other professional services industry use solutions like overhead uh, speakers and uh, IP television type solutions. And these are all um, very highly dependent on multicast routing if you're doing that on the switching side. Um, so we've introduced PIM sparse mode for that, and uh, that is going to make it very easy to set it up. And as far as the dashboard's concerned, again, the same thing is true, right, which is extremely easy to set up and lots of visibility and detail once you've got it set up in the event that you need to troubleshoot a multicast stream. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Um, let us know if you have any questions. I'm um, Tony uh, underscore Meraki on Twitter, and I'm going to pass this over to my dear friend, Joe. Shameless plug. So this is what I like to call the better than Tony's 
part of the presentation. Um, uh, hi guys, I'm Joe. I'm the product marketing manager for BMX. And I wanted to give everyone a quick update on some of the new capabilities that are coming to the MX platform and some of the new capabilities that have actually come to the platform recently because we've released a couple cool new things that not everyone may be aware of. Before we dive into that though, um, most of you have probably heard me or, or other folks on the team talk about Meraki SD WAN. If you've been following the MX for the last couple of years, it's been a big push that we've been making trying to really evolve the MX from being a primarily security focused box into both security and SD-WAN. And SD-WAN is kind of the direction that we're seeing that the routing and WAN market take, and we wanna make sure that we're addressing those needs for our customers. So I wanted to give a quick update on some of the things we're seeing in terms of SD-WAN adoption and the growth of this market within the Meraki customer base. Um, and I thought these were kind of some cool statistics to share with everyone. We've got over 350,000 MXs online today. Of those, over 130,000 of them have what we call auto VPN, right? Our cloud orchestrated VPN enabled. Um, of those 130,000, over 27,000 have dual uplinks, which means they can leverage automatic load balancing, automatic VPN failover. So that's where, in my opinion, you start to get into that SD WAN component, right? Where you have automatic load balancing, automatic failover, path control. And then from there, we have over 6,600 MXs with active SD-WAN policies. So these are things like, I want my VoIP to prefer my MPLS path. I want traffic to fail over if performance hits a certain threshold. So we're slowly seeing this kind of creep up and we've actually got a couple of um, recent deals that we've seen that are gonna bump these numbers up pretty significantly that are focused specifically on SD-WAN. So people coming to us and saying, we want an SD-WAN solution. We want to make better use of our bandwidth. We want to, you know, make our network connectivity more cost effective. And that's been driving some, uh, some business for us. And it's been a really cool thing to see in terms of how the, the market is transforming on the WAN side and how people are more and more trying to find solutions for those problems that aren't necessarily the traditional solutions because the traditional solutions are starting to get pretty expensive. So I just wanted to share that quick update. There's some other statistics here on the screen as well that I won't go through line by line, but I thought it was of interest. So with that, let's get into the actual uh, what's new component. There's a couple of new features or capabilities that I just wanted to highlight because they weren't something that you might have necessarily noticed in Dashboard. I know I've seen some social media activity that a few people have seen these things, have been excited by them, so I wanted to make sure everyone knows. A couple of recent additions to the MX capabilities are, one, you can now schedule security center reports. So if you go to the security center and dashboard where all of the malware protection and IPS events are held, up in the upper right-hand corner, similar to what you'd see in our summary reports, you can actually schedule an email, a recurring email, of those security center reports out to your administrators, to your security team, to whoever you want, in order to make sure that you're kind of getting consistently updated on what's going on in terms of security events and security posture in your network, which I personally think is a really, really big deal because you don't want to have to go into dashboard every single time you want to, you know, find out what's going on with your security in your environment. The second thing relates to our configuration templates feature. And for anyone who's not familiar with templates, it's basically a way to take configuring 10, 100, 1,000 locations and make it the same process, the same workflow as configuring one. So it's a big area of investment for us because we want to make sure that the solution scales, right? We want to make sure that for you know, professional services, retail, all these different environments where you have a lot of locations that you have to manage, you have to be able to stand up quickly, reconfigure quickly en masse. We wanna make sure that that's a, a good, clean, intuitive process with the Meraki solutions. Um, templates are not unique to MX, but there is a new kind of unique capability with templates in MX, which is you can now set DHCP reserved ranges and DHCP fixed IPs specific to individual networks, even if they're attached to a template, right? So you may have some of those settings that you don't want to templatize because they're different in every single location or some locations may differ from the template. You can now make those exceptions at a per network level. What I'm really excited to talk about though is the big uh, feature release that we actually have coming in the next couple months. So this will be something that everyone will be seeing. Um, there will be scheduled upgrades coming out a couple months down the road, but all these features that I'm about to talk about are available today in beta. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, you can reach out to the Meraki support team and you can actually get upgraded and try this stuff today. 
Uh, and we have actually a fairly large pool of customers doing that right now who are leveraging some of these new features. And I'm pretty excited because there are a lot of things here that I think are really going to add a lot of value for folks who are using the MX. So I want to run through these really quickly. Um, first of all, going back to the SD-WAN topic, Layer 7 SD-WAN policies. This is what you can see up here on the upper right-hand corner of this slide. So you can, instead of just setting, you know, I want this particular subnet or this particular port or this particular destination IP's traffic to be treated a certain way as it's passed between my locations or to my data center or to wherever it may be going, you can actually do that by application. So you can say, I want SIP traffic or WebEx traffic or any different type of application, right, as defined by our preset applications, or you can create custom rules using the same layer three and layer four capabilities that exist today. You can create all the policies either at layer three and layer four or at layer seven with applications. Um, since the way that most people consume bandwidth today is applications, right? Everyone cares about applications. We want to make sure that that's reflected in the way you build these policies so that it makes sense so that you don't have to translate the thing you want to do into the workflow that you use in the dashboard. Secondly, and this is one that's been a long time in coming, I've probably seen hundreds of requests over the years for this, so I'm very excited to be able to finally announce this. You will be able to set uplink IP configuration for MXs through dashboard. Um, it's the same process you use for APs, for switches. You go in to dashboard, you go to that uplink, you set its IP, you set the gateway, you set DNS, all that stuff. Um, you no longer have to use the local status page on the box to do this. Probably one of our most requested features over the years, so I'm, I'm very happy to, to be able to announce that. Um, another one that we've had a lot of requests for that we are making available is load monitoring. So the question we get is, how do I know if my MX is working too hard? How do I know if it's overloaded or if there's something wrong? Well, the good news is we're actually adding MX load indicators to the summary report. So in this new release, you'll be able to go to that summary report and see historical indications of what the load was on the MX. So you know, oh, there was a problem report at this time and there was a, load, a high load at this time. Maybe I'm starting to outgrow this MX or maybe there's something here I need to reach out to support about to keep you informed about kind of the health of your environment, the health of your MX. Um, hostname Firewall, just in the interest of not having to say that acronym, uh, Hostname Firewall allows you basically just to set a firewall rule for a DNS name, right? I want to block star.google.com because I, for some reason, really, really hate Google, uh, right? Whatever you want to do in terms of in, not just firewalling at layer three, but being able to actually firewall host names, you can now do that right there in dashboard in the same layer three firewall interface that we've had for years. This one's a bit more of a, a niche one, but it is important to I think a lot of our larger customers, so I wanted to call it out. You can now create a NAT rule that will NAT a subnet to a specific IP over the VPN. This is something we see commonly in financial, we see it sometimes in larger enterprise customers, um, and it's something that comes up fairly frequently. And then finally, an update to our Google Safe Search and YouTube for Schools features to use the newer DNS-based enforcement methods that Google recommends and play, more, uh, play nicer with the new Google implementations for those features. So that's all going to be coming very soon. Again, that's all available. If you want to try any of this stuff today, you can just reach out to support and get upgraded. And then the final thing that I want to mention are two other really, really huge advancements that are going to be coming that are not part of that particular release, but are also available in beta if you want to try them out. Um, the first, which is a virtual MX for AWS. Uh, for those of you who are sitting there going, but I use Azure, I use Azure, that's okay. Uh, we will be looking into Azure support as well. But the first thing we're going to be releasing is basically a virtual MX VPN concentrator that lives in AWS that you can use to terminate auto VPN tunnels and leverage all that Meraki SD-WAN capability that we've built into auto VPN over an AWS instance. So if you want to talk to your cloud infrastructure services or, you know, data that you're holding in the cloud and you want to do that using auto VPN for simplicity, for scalability, for all these reasons that auto VPN is so great, um, which I'm sure you all universally agree with, I don't have to go into detail. You can do that with Amazon Web Services now. And as I said, we will be looking into Azure and other cloud services as well going forward. And the second one is BGP. So one of the one of the biggest things that I've heard consistently since I, I joined the MX team is probably, well, we want more dynamic routing support, right? 
And we took a step in that direction by adding some OSPF capabilities a couple of years ago, but now we're moving into the space of having full bidirectional routing by adding BGP to the MX. And for me, the cool thing about this is you're going to be able to advertise BGP routes into AutoVPN or from AutoVPN out into some other routing infrastructure. And this means you can now pair an AutoVPN implementation with other routing infrastructures together. So if you have DMVPN, if you have a, you know, EIGRP routed network within your data center infrastructure or within your corporate offices and you want to tie that to a Meraki branch deployment where you're using AutoVPN, using Meraki SD-WAN, you'll be able to tie those together with BGP so that all those routes communicate automatically and you don't have to go through a whole bunch of steps of manual configuration. So this really plays nicely in that hybrid deployment model where you want to use Meraki in some places, but you have other solutions that you want to leverage elsewhere, and you want to be able to build one coherent deployment that kind of spans across all your different solutions and interoperates nicely. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul, who looks almost like this picture, except he very foolishly shaved his head recently. Uh, and he'll talk all about Systems Manager. Yeah, this might be the only time I won't complain about that photo, because at least it doesn't show my current haircut. So, <laughs> so I guess I'm okay with it. Hey, everyone. My name is Paul Wolf. I am the Product Marketing Manager for Systems Manager. Uh, Systems Manager is Cisco's Enterprise Mobility Management Solution. Uh, if you've seen or heard us talk about this at all, you've probably heard a lot that uh, we talk about how it's very easy to use, and then we'll basically inundate you with a thousand features and all the things that we launched recently can, since we're constantly iterating. I'm going to intentionally not do that this time. I'm going to dive into Dashboard. No offense to y'all, but I'm going to actually dive into Dashboard and just show you a couple of things. And there are two things that I want to do here. We'll start with the first one. If I come over to Dashboard, I want to show you one feature, and then I'll tell you what the second thing is after I do this. But the one feature I want to focus on right now is a feature called Managed App Configuration. So if you've heard about Managed App Configuration, let me show you how easy this is to set up. You basically pick your app settings. You can choose an application for one that's already installed or search for, many, for any app in the App Store that supports this. We'll return a list. Here's all the apps. Uh, and basically what this does is this allows you to push down very specific combinations of values and different things that allow you to configure the app. So let me tell you really quick why this matters. Uh, from one of the traditional classic examples of this, let's say you have an application that you're going to push out to all of your users, and they need to check into a one server IP address. Or maybe there's even the case where there's different servers depending on their location. Well, what this does is this allows you to configure something specifically. You can have some key that's your server IP, and then the value would be whatever their IP address should be. Maybe it's a local one, something that you can set up, or maybe you have some uh, remote location or something that's externally accessible. And this is a way to actually do specific configurations for apps remotely. So this can be really, really important in that case. It's going to drastically change. Of course, like we always talk about, it's going to make things a lot easier to manage. Uh, but in this case in particular, it actually it also adds a lot of power to the things that you can do. So another, uh, probably the most common example that we see utilized I will show you right now, which is uh, different ways to configure apps like Gmail, for example. You may have seen the traditional ways that you set up email, either you push down ActiveSync settings uh, to iOS, or if you have Samsung Knox, you can do that as well, and you basically just can, uh, can configure the host, account name, select a couple options, and then push that down. So that's how we've been doing Office 365 in the past. But now we have access to managed app config, We've enabled that for all of our users, and there's a couple really cool things here. So with this, one of the things that's really cool is that we'll show you all of these different keys that you have access to. So in this case, we added the Gmail app. The Gmail app is registered as one that supports managed app config, and so we on the dashboard side pulled down all of the different keys 
that you can use? Because I'm going to guess that you maybe offhand didn't assume that exchange underscore username key that you need to use for this. So you can just have to pull that down and we'll give you all the options. So this is another cool example where you can get kind of clever, get uh, a little bit more hacky on stuff, and you could actually use the native Gmail app for exchange on for all your different users. And another thing you might notice here, if you've seen this, if you've seen Manage App Config in uh, other EMM solutions, you've seen that they're all basically just this text or a Boolean type field and you just type in whatever you need there and it's manual per device. But one thing that we've done with, uh, again, the magic of the Meraki Cloud is that we already know we know that we know all your usernames. We've already integrated with Active Directory or maybe you've set it up. So here you can just select that option. You don't have to put in a value and we will actually update that on all the devices. So now all these devices, all the Android devices we have getting this profile, they're gonna get the Gmail app. It's gonna get provisioned for Exchange. We're gonna inject the username into there. We're gonna configure the Exchange host. And we're gonna do all of that automatically. It makes it really, really easy to configure email in an app that people are probably more used to using. So there's just another example. I'm going to give you uh, one more example of managed app config here. Uh, a good one for this, let's say I'm doing an iOS app and you want to push down Dropbox settings to here. I don't know if you've seen Dropbox Enterprise. Uh, basically it's an enterprise file sync and sharing solution where you can keep all of your data in one house. You can make sure the devices are managed. Uh, it's basically just a better way to do content management and to protect your data. So uh, another example of Manage App Config, if you want to use this to push out to Dropbox, you have a key that is the token, and then you just type in whatever your token is from Dropbox, and now only devices that are enrolled and are in this test group actually get the right token that allows them to talk to your Dropbox account. So hopefully uh, that's a couple of specific things. Instead of giving you the last six features or things that we've been working on, I kind of wanted to dive into one and get a little bit more nerdy. Uh, Joe's giving me some looks now. Uh, get a little bit more nerdy on the specifics of these. And I said when I started that I was going to give you, that I was going to do two things. The first thing was going to be to show you this. The second one is to tease you a little bit. I do have a lot of things that we've been doing that we are going to be announcing and having some fun with next month. I'm not going to tell you the time, but I will tell you that you're going to you should get ready to fall in love with Systems Manager all over again. So with that note, passing it over to George. Oh, just one second. Um, thank you very much. Let's go full screen. Great. So. Uh, Let's just say that, first of all, thank you, Paul, for that uh, tease. Next up, uh, unfortunately, we're doing quite well for time, which means that you may have to listen to George talk for a little longer than we initially anticipated. But, it, but no, it's all wonderful. Uh, George is here. He's got his hat on. I'll put a picture up on Twitter in a moment uh, from Rocky Simon. Um, here he is. Take it away, Mr. B. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, so I'm very excited to once again be here at quarterly uh, the second quarterly where we get to talk about uh, the cameras and um, what's fantastic is having just launched it back uh, in October uh, when we uh, had the last quarterly we now have started to see customer deployments we've started to see the growth in the sales of the camera and we really believe we've had an eye on the future when it came to delivering the MV architecture and what we the camera industry as a whole will start moving to. And that's this approach regarding simplified deployment and design of your cameras. You don't have to have all of these components that have typically been mandatory in the past. No network video recorder, NVR, no video management software, VMS. You just buy a camera and a license for the Meraki dashboard and, you, and away you go. And you can do all of this because of the integrated storage we have in the camera. That's 128 gigabytes of high endurance, industrial grade, solid state storage in every camera, warranted as part of the overall camera hardware. And so you can buy one camera, or you can buy 100 cameras, or you can buy tens of thousands of cameras, and you don't need to worry about anything else. And this is something that we are seeing being exceptionally popular in, 
in terms of the sort of main uh, selling point, the, the story that really resonates with customers, and why people are choosing to buy and deploy MV. You can get it up and running in a fraction of the time that you would with a traditional system, and it really sort of um, validates our philosophy around focusing on solving problems and not on building features. Uh, during the research for this, I spoke to a number of people who had not a single good thing to say about their NDR, and I started to see a great number of similarities between the sort of camera world here and something that a lot of you may be familiar with in the consumer world, which is, for example, 3D TVs. So if we go back a few years and you were in the market to buy a new TV for your home, you'd go out and you'd go to uh, your local shop or online and you would look at what TVs were available. <laughs> and a few years ago, 3D was going to be the next big thing in uh, television. But almost everyone I've come across in my meetings with customers and people at trade shows, I've found absolutely no one that has used the 3D capability of their TV more than once if they have used it. And so this feature, although that differentiator that people made their purchasing decision on, didn't end up being useful to the consumer. And so using that, we wanted to focus on those core problems we heard about time and time again, which was the NVR and the VMS. So this is why we've been seeing such a huge amount of growth in the camera space. But one of the important things as a part of all of this uh, architecture deployment is ensuring comprehensive security. And in recent months, there's been some really quite uh, sort of headline news when it comes to the security of IoT devices, and especially the security and the vulnerability of things such as NVRs and connected cameras. And with the Meraki MV, we, uh, I'm just going to say, we just did it right, first of all. And the reason we did it right is that we have people like Joe and the fantastic MX team, we have the wireless team. We have a lot of people with a huge amount of expertise in building critical network infrastructure and doing security for the network. So this isn't something that we have had to bolt on. This is part of the Meraki DNA. It's built into the way we look at how we design products. And it's not an afterthought when it comes to building the camera. And so we have everything encrypted by default. So all the storage on the camera is encrypted so that in the worst case scenario, should someone uh, go steal your camera, all that footage is safe from them being able to look at it. All the transport of the footage from the camera, so that's the video delivery over the internet or over your local network, is all encrypted. And we have per camera trusted certificates that use a public key infrastructure and are not self-signed. This is the most secure way that we could deploy this type of infrastructure. And then we have the Mac EM tunnel, that's the communication between the cloud and the device, that's how you configure all Mac devices through dashboard, and that's encrypted as well. And all of this means you end up with the most secure camera platform that you could go and deploy in the market today. And when we look at the uh, sort of devastation that things like the Mira botnet caused on a lot of people around the world with distributed denial of service attacks, you need to look at it from sort of two angles, which is firstly, you don't want to have your devices unwillingly participate on an attack on an innocent third party, either a government entity, a school, or maybe even a, another company. But you also don't want people to have that easy access or any access to the control of your devices. If they gain control of your devices, they can access the video, and then they can start doing things with that which you may not want them to do. So we've put a lot of effort into this, and we're going to continue evolving our security and provide further integration with more of our products so that you can deploy the Meraki cameras sure in the knowledge that you have the best possible solution when it comes to camera security. So one of the other things that we uh, released shortly after the launch of the camera is the upgrade to the Meraki mobile app. And uh, I think this is something that not enough people have uh, noticed, and that's why I really wanted to put some focus on it because it's become um, my default way of configuring new cameras. Uh, previously, you would have to set up your camera, uh, go back to your desk and you would focus it and adjust it from dashboard, or you could take your laptop with you and you could do that while you were there. But 
it was not very easy. It was a bit complicated and you could be a bit worried for your laptop falling off the top of a ladder. Well, now with integration into both the iOS and the Android version of the Maraki Dashboard app, this is not a separate app. This is in your normal app, so you can view the full stack. You've got your uh, switches, your security appliances. Now you have cameras in there as well. You can focus, manage, and control your cameras remotely through your phone. So I have a number of screenshots here. I have my colleague, uh, Justin, who's the product specialist for the camera, setting up one of our bike room cameras, which I'm hopefully gonna demonstrate to you through the app very shortly using his iPhone there. So when you're trying to aim it uh, at the right location, so you're trying to get either a good field of view to provide context to what's going on, or to provide a real close-up shot to capture the identity of someone walking through a door, you can make sure you get this right first time, reducing the installation time and reducing potential additional site visits. You can then zoom the camera, and then you can use the new autofocus capability to just hit the button and the camera will become sharply in focus. And on the right-hand side of my slide here, you can see a number of examples of the camera, uh, me in a different hat, the one I'm currently wearing now, and also some night vision shots of that camera as well. So I'm gonna quickly uh, switch to uh, the uh, QuickTime app. Uh, so we're gonna share that with you here. And we're gonna go share the Maraki app. So I'm logged into the app and uh, I'm looking at the Maraki office in San Francisco. And so if I open this uh, side menu, you can see that we have all our other products. And at the bottom here, I've selected uh, switch um, cameras. So if I go to cameras, we can see my cameras here and I could go in and I could say, okay, and look at the bike room cameras. And I want to look at say, uh, one of these uh, particular cameras here. So I want to look at the central at bike room rack. We have all the standard uh, pieces of information you would get with other products. So you have things like that, the map. And I can click live here and it'll go off to the camera and it'll get the stream from the camera. And then if I was there and I wanted to do some setup, I could go and do that. I can change things such as the aperture or the rotation of the camera as well. So say I wanted to uh, zoom this particular camera in, I can sort of uh, press the zoom button there it will go off to the camera and start uh, zooming that. Now, I'm hoping that's going to work in my uh, tethered scenario. Uh, I do have uh, some restrictions to prevent my colleagues from uh, changing the cameras to uh, look at uh, individual uh, bicycles. Uh, everyone obviously feels that their uh, bicycle is the most important, so uh, it might not uh, change this. But you get the idea. You can zoom it in. You can zoom it out. Once you've got it at the right uh, view, you can then focus it. So if I go find a zoomed in one, I can show you uh, something that will be a little more representative for you of what a camera will look like zoomed in. And so these sort of like highly zoomed cameras, these are important for uh, the sort of identity shot. When someone walks through the door and you want to see who they are, then this is the one that's going to give you uh, that image of their face. The wider angle ones, so some of the other ones that we, uh, we've had in here, these are the ones that are going to allow you to work out what they did. Did they take that handbag? Did they pick up that laptop? Did they steal that phone? So I highly recommend for any one of you that have cameras on trial, are looking at purchasing cameras, or already have some cameras, that you go and get the Maraki mobile app. It really does offer a huge amount of benefit when it comes to uh, using the Maraki cameras. So my last slide is I wanted to sort of give you an idea of where we're going in the future. Simon has very strictly said no roadmap. So rather than a roadmap, um, what I have uh, come to share with customers is the development principles that guide the Meraki MV engineering team. So this is what we're thinking about, and these are the sort of direction that we go. So for example, cost reduction through architectural simplification is what we have to deliver day one. This is no NVR, this is no VMS, this is storage on camera, this is no software, just dashboard, making it very easy to use. This gets you great value straight out of the box. Secondly, we have operational simplification through automation. What I mean by this is things such as our motion search, 
I didn't demonstrate it today, but you can watch a demo online or attend one of our webinars or try a camera, and you can retrospectively go back in time and find anything that changed and see what happened. You can select an area of the screen, such as the laptop that went missing or the bicycle that was taken, and it will try and retrieve all the footage where something changed. So you don't have to watch hours and hours of footage. You can find just a few minutes when something happened. And then finally, we have business values for intelligence. And so this isn't a set of uh, principles where we have a feature that I can show you right now, but if I did not have my hand tied, I could tell you maybe a little more about it. But uh, stick with us. Uh, we are working uh, ex on a number of very exciting features here where we look at the camera as a sensor rather than purely as a security tool. Can we take that image data and apply it to other problems, potentially in marketing, business operations, occupational safety, and so on? And so with that, we'll be releasing features that enhance the value of the camera to different people and different groups within an organization. And we'll be doing that over time while additionally putting more effort into the cost reduction through architectural simplification and the operational simplification through automation. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Simon, and then I think we're going to go on to Q&A. Thanks, George. That was an awesome session, as were all of the product sessions today. Um, I think MV has a particularly uh, lucky product in the sense that it just demos so well. And uh, that, that uh, what we can do with that mobile app is just fantastic. What we'll do now is, uh, before we depart for the rest of our days, we'll have a quick look at the uh, questions that you guys have sent in. Uh, see if we've got some questions that we can share with you all. So just bear with me a moment. I'm just going to bring up the uh, Q&A panel, and I may pick on uh, some of the guys in the room here to help me out if need be. So let's have a look what we got. And obviously, if you have any last-minute questions, now's your opportunity to ask those. Okay, so there's a question around what we're doing with the rest of the wireless portfolio. So we'll obviously be making announcements uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, this is obviously a portfolio like all the others, which is sort of constantly evolving over time. I think these new uh, introductions, the 30H and the 33, they really do help position us very effectively for that hospitality market and, and also for uh, environments where we simply need some Wi-Fi coverage. Maybe we don't need that super high performance and density uh, that we can get with the uh, the more flagship uh, access points. So uh, great questions on the phone came in as well. So we have uh, the normal question that's very understandable, which is when are we going to get the phone in my geo? And uh, frankly, if I wasn't in the US, I'd be asking exactly the same question. Uh, the good news here is we are actively working on this every day. We will have uh, an exciting announcement to make uh, right around the start of the next month, and uh, after that, we'll be uh, we'll be extending to other countries as well. So we're working on technical solutions that will help us to expand that. So do bear with us a little longer. Uh, we're really excited to get that phone to as many as we possibly can. So there was a question here about uh, the MR30H and whether the four ports on there are. Uh, power over Ethernet. Uh, my understanding is that there's just one port on there which has uh, PoE Plus available on it, so you will be able to uh, to power your devices from that as well. So that gives it that extra uh, usefulness in its intended deployment scenarios, which will be typically in hospitality environments. So there was a question here about whether you can uh, do a simultaneous ring on a, a PSTN number and a, uh, and a cell phone at the same time. Yes, we can absolutely do that with the call forwarding functionality uh, on Meraki MC. So the call, yeah, the call just needs to come in and then we get that forwarded to the appropriate number. Uh, there's a <laughs> We've got a very important question here about where George gets all his hats from. George, do tell us. 
Uh, the hats are from all over the world, but I'll give you two recommendations. If you're on the west coast of America, you should try Gordon Bros for well-priced and high-quality hats. Or you can go, if you want the best hats in the world, go to London, go to Lock & Co. Uh, it was founded in the 1600s, still in the same shop, and they invented the bowler hat. So I can recommend both of those organizations. Thank you, George. Illuminating as always. Um, <laughs> All right, we've had a few questions come in about uh, where people can get copies of the slides and uh, and so on. What the way we normally do it with the with the quarterly is we record this session and hopefully before the end of the week we'll have this up on YouTube. So if you do want to recap anything that you've seen and uh, goodness we've gone through a lot on today's session, uh, you'll have an opportunity to do that there. All right, let's continue on with questions. Bear with me. How many switches can you stack together? Oh, I think Tony is asking me a quiz question. <laughs> How many switches can we quiz together? Stack together. <laughs> You're nervous now. I need, I need a vacation. Uh, so already, um, so we can stack up to eight units in uh, in a stack of switches. So for any of the Meraki stackable switch families that applies, we can go up to eight units high. Obviously, the, the solution can be extended way beyond that if you're using aggregation switching as well uh, to really help grow true enterprise size deployments. So I have a question here about pushing uh, group policy attributes from radius servers to the switch. Uh, so I'm getting a nod from Tony. This looks like something, I think he wants to tell us something more about that. Hang on. So uh, with the introduction of uh, change of authorization, et cetera, uh, it is possible to build group policies and extend those out um, by nature of VLAN. The VLAN PVT ID attribute can be passed by the switch. So depending on what other solutions you have in your infrastructure, this is possible. Uh, we have some details around this at documentation.meraki.com. Thanks for the question. So formal. It did sound a little formal, didn't it? Yeah. He's always a professional, Tony. Um, so we have a question here about whether SD-WAN is an MPLS replacement. And uh, I mean, that's a very good question. There are actually multiple answers to it. You can absolutely treat it as a potential replacement for MPLS uh, in the sense that it provides you with intelligent forwarding across secured connections between sites. So it's almost like a virtual private circuit, uh, which of course MPLS is way more flexible. It gives you the power to be able to make changes whenever you need to. And we have seen some really significant cost savings for customers who've chosen to take this particular path, which is why the industry has been paying some attention to this uh, this technology. I think the Meraki implementation, true Meraki, it enables you to really take advantage of those multiple forwarding paths in the most efficient and intelligent way possible without having to learn a bunch of code and remember a bunch of commands. All right, I think we'll do just one more question and then we'll wrap things up. So there's a question on the MX, which is uh, whether layer seven policies are any more taxing for the CPU than uh, the layer two or layer three sort of ACL based firewalls. This is a question that we've had many times in the past and the uh, it gives me an opportunity to just remind everyone who's attending that Meraki very deliberately puts powerful CPUs into all of its equipment, including its access points, uh, which enables those uh, devices to be able to easily handle the encryption levels and the more powerful processing that deep action requires within the local box. So that's a key factor with Meraki if you choose us as a platform uh, that you can expect to be able to apply all of the features that you see with no loss in performance for the box. Okay, so I think it's time to wrap up this Meraki quarterly. It's 10 o'clock, so uh, it has been a very successful session, I think. We have tra traveled through a lot of slides, a lot of uh, demo, and it's been fantastic to have you all with us. Thanks for taking time out of your day today. We will share these as a YouTube video fairly soon, so look out for that. And we very much look forward to welcoming you back at the next Meraki quarterly in three months' time. Thanks for attending. Bye for now.